I looked down at my legs. They had gone black. My heart sank. I didn't know how to console. I didn't know what to say. I would hold my head thinking that it was just going to explode, and I thought I was going to die right then and there. It was like she was having a nervous breakdown. I just did not want to lose my legs. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. When Diane Dyke's legs turn a bizarre and horrifying color, she's confronted with a shocking twist of fate. She may lose her legs or have to accept something even worse. I was afraid I was doomed to suffer like this for the rest of my life. I was desperate to be put out of my pain. Then, when Teresa Zidansky finds out she's having a second child, she's thrilled beyond belief until she's forced to face a terrifying reality that may threaten her life and her babies. Why was the pain so intense? It was kind of like, oh my God, now what? What is this girl gonna go through? How much more can Teresa handle? In the fall of 1990, life was as good as it gets for 23-year-old Diane Dyke. She loved her job as a teacher and was thrilled to have finally settled down with her soulmate. I married my high school sweetheart, Scott. We just had so many hopes and dreams. We put each other through school. I became a teacher, and he got a job at the same school where I worked. Diane was a very loving um, school teacher. She had probably anywhere from 15 to 20 little special ed children from four to six years of age. I loved those children. I couldn't wait to see them every morning and give lots of hugs and kisses. Couldn't wait to have children of my own. Outside of the classroom, she was quite an athlete, full of vim and vigor. We lived in Florida, so I rode my bike everywhere I went. I was a junior Olympic swimmer, and I taught dance classes. Exercise and working out was my life. Everything seems perfect. Until one day in late October, when Diane notices a strange sensation in her right foot. When I sat down and took my shoe off, I noticed that there was two red bumps on the arch of my foot. And I thought, well, how did a spider get in my shoe and bite my foot? That was the only thing I could think of. Diane dismisses the odd mark and goes to bed. But nothing could have prepared her for what happens the moment she wakes up. I went to get out of bed and I fell to the floor. My foot was swollen two times its size. The two red spots seemed to have spread. It looked like uh, someone had beat me with a baseball bat. The pain was excruciating. And so I crawled to get help from my husband. Scott was quite horrified when he saw my foot. And so uh, he picked me up and he took me right down to the emergency room. When they finally got me there, the doctor looked at it and he thought I had a hematoma. A hematoma is a mass of blood that is collected in an organ, a body space, or in tissue as a result of a broken blood vessel. He thought I must have hit my foot and didn't know it. I thought that was very strange because how could I hit my foot that hard and not know it? So it didn't make any sense to me. I just followed his directions, which was to take anti-inflammatories, to use crutches, and to not go to work. And if it didn't get better, to go to my uh, primary care physician. Sure enough, the bruising and pain slowly begin to fade. But a few days later, just when Diane thinks she's out of the woods, a strange new symptom rears its head. I was having lots of red spots, and they seemed to be connecting like a road map on my legs. It was bizarre. Frightened, Diane makes an emergency appointment with her family doctor. He, too, is puzzled by the odd pattern of spots and assures her they'll get to the bottom of it. But after performing a series of specialized tests, the medical team comes up empty. They really didn't have a whole lot of information for me. It looked like everything was normal. Frustrated and more than a little worried, Diane heads home empty-handed. But it isn't long before the painful episodes return with a vengeance. 
the attacks would come on usually in my feet and would progress from my toes to the, the ankles. I was getting bruising and red streaks. There would be swelling and bumps all around like there was tennis balls underneath my skin. It was excruciating and it was really frightening. Over the next several months, Diane visits doctor after doctor in a desperate search for answers. But no one can explain the baffling attacks. It was so disappointing because it was just this vicious cycle of go and get poked and prod it and then wait and get no results. Then, six months after Diane first noticed the strange mark on her foot, things take a sudden turn for the worse. At work one day, I could feel the swelling and the discomfort was extending uh, into my ankles. I took the students outside to play on the playground, and then we came back into the building, and I uh, played with the children until finally I could not ignore it at all anymore. I had to get to the bathroom, and I barely made it there. I looked down at my legs. They had gone black. This bloody black, discolored, inflaming, uh, whatever it was. I don't believe I've ever felt pain like that in my entire life. I felt like there was a million bugs crawling underneath my skin and there was burning. It was so scary. I did not know what to make of it. I went to the front desk to have the secretary buzz um, Scott in his classroom. When he saw what was going on, he was extremely frightened. He picked me up and put me in the car to take me directly to the emergency room. After taking one look at Diane's black and swollen legs, the ER nurses put her on a stretcher and rush her into the nearest exam room. There was a frenzy of activity around. They put me on pain medication. It wasn't really helping anything. A nurse came in every uh, few minutes to check me, to take blood, and the doctor at the hospital had no clue what was going on. He said he would have some specialists come visit and take a look and see if he could get some help with my case. Just a few minutes later, a vascular surgeon arrives to examine Diane's legs. At that time, it was as black as black can be. He said he had never seen anything like it. He was touching my thigh area right above where the discoloration stopped. And he said we'd probably have to take it off right here. That was the first time I really realized that I could actually lose my legs. For six months, Diane Dyke has endured mysterious and excruciatingly painful episodes of swelling and discoloration in her legs. Now, the worst attack yet has landed her in the emergency room, where doctors have told her she may lose her legs. Because my legs had turned black, he thought that there was gangrene coming on. He thought that there was no oxygen getting to my tissue. Gangrene is a type of tissue death which occurs as the result of an insufficient supply of blood. Without treatment, it can quickly spread to vital organs and lead to death. It was extremely upsetting to hear him say that word, amputation. I was scared out of my mind because I couldn't imagine life without my legs. He um, went to my heel and he felt a pulse. So he said to the nurse, I'm not gonna take them off yet, but we're gonna have to keep a close eye on it. And if we lose that pulse in her heel, then call me back immediately. And he left the room. I was so glad when that doctor was heading out the door. After he left, I thought to myself, I don't ever wanna see that doctor again because I just did not wanna lose my legs. Over the next several days, doctors find themselves racing against the clock, performing countless blood tests in an all-out effort to determine why Diane's legs have turned pitch black. They test me for leukemia. They tested me for some types of lymphomic cancer. They test me for rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, day after day, I got no answer. 
They had no idea why I had had this attack, what it meant, what it was connected to, nothing. I rested in bed under the covers and I prayed for an answer. But the tests reveal nothing. And after five days, the swelling and discoloration simply fade away on their own, leaving the doctors completely baffled. They decided to discharge me because they, they didn't know what was wrong or what had brought it on. It was horrible. I mean, how many times can my legs keep coming back? I didn't know. Frightened and frustrated, Diane returns home. But the mysterious attacks only intensify. What started to be one day a week became two days a week, then three days a week of flaring. Like I'd work through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and by Thursday, Friday, I was having a flare up. And by the Saturday night, I was completely unable to walk. I was embarrassed to really talk about it or show anyone what was happening, but it was becoming increasingly more difficult to hide the symptoms. I remember her being on crutches at school, her legs. It looked like just the surface blood vessels had just burst and it would turn real red, bruised and black and blue, and it slowed her down. I wasn't able to give my students everything that they needed. I was distracted by the, my own pain, and no matter how hard I tried to overcome it, I wasn't able to walk well or play with them. I was missing more and more work. Going outside or standing seemed to bring on a flare-up. It seemed the only safe thing to do was stay in bed. I was afraid I was doomed to suffer like this for the rest of my life in cycles of, of extreme pain. I saw my life slipping away, and I was losing all hope. As the months turn into years, Diane's pain and distress take an ever-increasing toll on her marriage. Diane started pulling away from Scott because she didn't want to be a burden on him. The marriage was um, suffering terribly. I felt unlovable. There was a day that finally came that I felt so broken that I thought Scott would be better off without me. And I remember seeing the look on his face when I told him that I wanted to leave. I really felt like I was dying inside and he didn't want me to go, but I went. I thought I was doing him a favor. I made choices for him that weren't mine to make. And I ruined everything that mattered to me most. It was like she was having a nervous breakdown. Diane hit rock bottom. I would pray that someone would just shoot me and put me out of my misery, because I couldn't imagine living this life anymore. I was desperate to be put out of my pain. My doctor was really frustrated with my case. He didn't know what else to do, so he decided that he was going to send me to the University of South Florida to see if they could help figure out what this mystery disease was. In February of 1993, Diane makes an appointment with dermatologist Dr. Philip Schenefeld at the University of South Florida in Tampa. We talked with her about her problem and examined her skin. Clinically on the skin, she had little sort of purplish marks, what's called palpable purpura, that were slightly raised. There were also some reddish areas as she sat there in our office. She was gradually getting a few more of the purple spots moving up her leg. I don't recall having seen anything with the purpura where they were just appearing right in front of us. It's a critical clue for Dr. Schenefeld. And in that moment, the mysterious case of Diane Dyke suddenly comes into focus. Our office tends to be kept fairly cool. The spreading made us wonder whether there was some factor such as cold that was making her uh, have these spread. At that point, I felt that we needed to test for a specific protein that might be related to cold exposure that might be involved in this process. He seemed rather confident, but I had also heard that from the doctor before that, so I knew better than to get my hopes up too high. To confirm his hunch, Dr. Schenefeld has Diane's blood drawn and sent to the lab for testing. It was exhausting to wait to hear something 
um, that could be great news uh, or it could be bad news, but I just wanted to hear some news so we could get to the bottom of it. The wait seems endless, but finally, six days later, the results are in. My hunch was confirmed. Diane did have cryoglobulinemia. Cryoglobulinemia is a blood disorder in which the body produces excessive amounts of defective antibodies called cryoglobulins. In healthy individuals, antibodies help fight bacteria and viruses. But in patients like Diane, dangerous amounts of the faulty antibodies are produced. When her temperature drops significantly below 98.6 degrees, these cryoglobulins can cluster together in blood vessels, blocking circulation and inflaming the vessel walls. Cryoglobulinemia means cold, globe-like structure in the blood. In Diane's blood, what's happening is that the blood, as it chills, it turns into a sort of a semi-solid. Just like if you mix up a batch of jello and pour it into a mold and you let it sit and then you cool it, her blood turns into the jelly-like material. The moment that he told me that I had cryoglobulinemia, I remember feeling as if I was in a vacuum. I could see his mouth moving, but I really wasn't making out what the words were that he was saying. That just really didn't make any sense to me. Dr. Schenefeld goes on to explain that all of Diane's seemingly unrelated symptoms were triggered by the air conditioning in her home and school. When the cooling occurs and the blood gels in the little vessels in the skin, blood behind it can't get through. The cryoglobulins were also signaling an inflammatory process to start up in the blood vessel. Then that weakens the vessel wall, and so the vessel can actually break and have blood leak out. I started to look back and realize that I would go outside with my students and get sweaty and warm and come back into the cold, and I was having flare-up after flare-up. With each episode, her blood vessels would rupture, causing the severe discoloration and swelling. As the blood vessels burst, initially the color is more reddish, and once it's out in the tissues for a while, it can change more to a blackish color. There can be swelling because the blood has difficulty getting back up the legs because the channels have been damaged. Unbeknownst to Diane, every time she crawled into bed, she was helping to diminish the effects of the condition. Staying at home under the covers would allow the legs to warm, would allow the jelly material to turn back to normal liquid. But as soon as she was back on her feet, her legs would be exposed to cool air again, and the agonizing attacks would return with a vengeance. It was all kind of starting to come together, but it was hard to grasp everything he was explaining to me. And after struggling with the debilitating disease for more than two years, Diane can't help but wonder why it took so long to get a diagnosis. Cryoglobulinemia is relatively rare. We don't know why people like Diane develop this process. Cryoglobulins will not show up specifically in other blood tests. It takes doing the specific procedures to look for them, to find them. But the harsh truth is undeniable. If Diane had not been properly diagnosed when she was, her future would have been bleak. It's possible to have kidney failure or problems with circulation in the heart that might lead to heart attack or stroke. Progressive damage to the blood vessels can lead to either difficulty with walking or actual need for amputation. I asked him, what can I take to make my body get better again? And what he told me would change my life forever. Diane Dyke has just discovered that she has an extremely rare and potentially life-threatening blood disorder called cryoglobulinemia. It causes her blood to solidify into a jelly-like substance when her body temperature drops significantly below 98.6 degrees. I thought it'll be such a blessing when that's over and I don't have to face that day after day. Unfortunately though, Diane must now learn to live with a grim reality. There is no cure that we know of for cryoglobulinemia. 
The first treatment is to keep the extremities warm. Another factor that can be used to treat the inflammation is a steroid anti-inflammatory. I had expected there would be a clean cut answer to overcome it and to beat it, but that was not what I got. So it was a very uh, overwhelming moment. Individuals with cryoglobulinemia have to avoid exposure to cold as a key factor in their daily living. We don't think what it would mean to have that kind of limitation in our lives. The normal everyday activities that I so often taken for granted would not be safe for me to do anymore. So I had to uh, wear gloves and mittens and lots of layers of clothing. Then that's just not something that's normal in a grocery store in Florida to see someone with full-on ski gear just to get through their shopping experience. Diane must also make sure to limit the amount of stress put on her body, which unfortunately means giving up her most cherished hopes. It is inadvisable for someone with cryoglobulinemia to have children. Blood clots are a higher incident during pregnancy. That broke my heart. I'd always wanted to have children. I even had their names picked out. It's a trying time for Diane, but over the years she has learned to manage her disease, even though it has meant letting go of her career goals. I had to give up my, my life stream and my career of teaching. The variables that I couldn't control in the classroom were just too dangerous for me. And it was so disappointing. I felt so alone. But then the athlete in me wanted to rise up and say, OK, we can beat this. Today, 16 years since she was diagnosed, Diane is successfully fighting her disease. Her optimism and spirit were the first things Paul Dyke noticed when they were introduced. At a dinner party, I met uh, Paul. And less than a month later, he proposed to me on Valentine's Day. Diane is my hero. Her ability to look at life in the positive way that she does has impacted so many people. He's tried to help me every step of the way to find a way to overcome this disease. Diane is a go-getter. It's amazing what she does despite her physical challenges. Through our organization called Second Chance with Saving Grace, I try to encourage people, no matter how sick or broken they feel, that there's important things that only they can do. And that's brought such purpose to my life. Whether they have to roll me in on a gurney, I'm going to go, and I'm going to let people know that they matter, and to not give up no matter what. While Diane Dyke experienced painful episodes that waxed and waned over a period of years, Teresa Zidansky was blindsided by a series of bizarre symptoms that set in and refused to go away. In the spring of 2003, 31-year-old Teresa Miller was living in San Antonio and working as a financial analyst. Her whole life revolved around her son, who she was raising single-handedly. I had a son, Zachary, and we did everything together. I said I would never get married. But all that changed later that year when she met Frank Zidansky through an online dating service. And though the logistics were difficult, there was an instant spark between them. I had a job as a truck driver, and I was on the road pretty much all the time. But Teresa and I uh, talked up every day. I basically had a phone to my ear constantly. We just couldn't get enough of each other. 18 months later, Teresa and Frank decide to tie the knot. I married Frank in January 2005. We started planning our future and talked about having children. And I got pregnant right away. We were ecstatic to find out we were having a girl. The baby was growing. Everything was great. But in March of 2005, Teresa, now two months pregnant, wakes up one morning to a terrifying sensation. I could not feel the right side of my face. I thought it was kind of odd. So I looked at the mirror and I couldn't feel anything from my eye down to the lower part of my chin. I immediately called my mother. Teresa said, Mom, my face feels very strange. I've never had any feeling like this before and something is wrong. 
My teeth were numb, half of my tongue was numb. The numbness felt like a dentist giving you a shot of Novocaine. Alarmed, Teresa makes an emergency appointment with her doctor. The doctor basically tapped on my face, looked at my, my nose, my throat, in my ears. After he did the examination, he said that it was pregnancy rhinitis. Pregnancy rhinitis is a condition in which a pregnant woman's high level of estrogen causes membranes in the sinuses to swell. In severe cases, nerves are affected, and a patient's face can become numb. He said to just wait it out, and it should go away in a matter of a couple months, or it could be the whole pregnancy. I wasn't happy, knowing that this could happen uh, for the rest of the pregnancy, but I had all my faith put into him by what he told me. Although the complete lack of feeling on one side of her face is disturbing, Teresa focuses on the good news. At each and every checkup, her baby seems to be doing just fine. The baby was kicking and heartbeat was excellent. At that point, all that she could do is to bear the, the, the symptoms that she was having until after the pregnancy. Teresa does her best to deal with the annoying numbness. But just a few months later, Teresa's life is turned completely upside down when an unusual new symptom sets in. I'd be walking and I started veering to the right. It seemed like I tended to waddle, which most people, that can be a sign of pregnancy. And the way I was carrying my daughter, she was all out in the front. And so I never thought anything about it until then it became a constant going to the right. I said, Teresa, you're not drinking anything, are you? And she says, no, Mom. And I said, well, you're walking like you've had too much to drink. And she said, I, I can't walk right. I'm trying, but it's not, it's not walking the way that I want to walk. And her body just did this automatically. I would walk into walls or bump into people if I was shopping somewhere. I was worried that I would fall and lose my footing and hurt myself or the baby. I've never seen any symptom like that with a, with a pregnancy. And she'd have bruises all over. And I said, what did you do? She says, Mom, I ran into the door. I can't help it, Mom. And then I really began to worry about her. There was something abnormal going on in her body. But the baby was the first thing that we were all concerned with. When I went in for my checkup, which were starting to happen every two weeks at this point, I mentioned it to the doctor. The doctor's rapport was, the baby's doing great. Don't worry about it. When you get bigger, you're more prone to lose your balance. One day, Teresa had said to me, she says, Mom, I wish this pregnancy would get over. I can't stand walking into the walls. She says, I can't stand myself anymore. It was just breaking my heart every day, little by little. I was really concerned. I told her there's something else that's going on, but the doctors say that everything's fine, so it was really frustrating at that point. But in August, Teresa, now seven months pregnant, is blindsided by a frightening new symptom. I turned on the shower and I touched the water with my left hand and noticed it was cold. And I immediately panicked thinking, uh-oh, something is wrong with our water heater. So then I turned and used my right hand to check it and it was hot. That immediately set warning signs to me. The feeling I had on my left side was like pins and needles. It started with my arm and then by the end of the day, the numbness and tingling was starting to happen in my lower leg. I was very worried because I haven't heard of somebody having that kind of a feeling. Uh, I told Teresa at that point that she needed to call the doctor. Panicked that something could be wrong with her baby, Teresa checks in with her OBGYN that same afternoon. The doctor put me on a stress monitor and the baby's heartbeat was excellent. We had a sonogram and she was doing wonderfully. So she explained to me, basically at this point, the baby was laying on a nerve and that numb and tingly feeling could happen uh, for the rest of the pregnancy. For the next month, Teresa does her best to ignore the bizarre numbness and tingling sensations. But the day before the baby is due, she wakes up with a debilitating new symptom. I started having a headache. I just thought I was having a sinus headache since I was having pregnancy rhinitis the whole time. 
but the headache kept getting worse and worse. I would hold my head thinking that it was just going to explode and I thought I was going to die right then and there. My headache was just so excruciating. I called my doctor. The doctor said, it sounds like you possibly have a migraine, which could be the onset of labor. Frank was about three and a half hours away doing a run. So I asked my neighbor um, if he could come and, and take me to the hospital. And then I called my mom and asked her to come over and get my son. I got a phone call from Teresa saying that she was going to the hospital. I was frightened and, and concerned. If something's going wrong with the baby, could it be affecting her? I told her I would be there as soon as possible. They hooked me up to a monitor and checked the baby's heartbeat. It was perfect. Um, they felt the baby. She was kicking. But concerned that Teresa may be going into labor, the doctors insist she stay overnight. We were really worried if, you know, there were some problems with the baby neurologically because I was feeling these effects with the headaches and the numbness. The next morning, Teresa's contractions begin. And one hour later, she and Frank welcome their daughter, Kendra, into the world. Kendra was seven pounds, six ounces. When the doctor held her up for me to see her, she stuck her tongue out at me. So I kind of felt at this point, all these things that I was, I was having during my pregnancy, she was making them happen. Pure happiness is the only thing I can say. The baby and Teresa were both healthy, um, which took a big weight off of me. I still had the, the numbness and the sensations in my, my arm and my leg, but the doctor said it would dissipate over a couple of weeks. Don't worry about them. But over the next several weeks, Teresa's troubling symptoms don't subside, making even the simplest and most routine aspects of motherhood a struggle. Changing her was hard for me. My left arm would get tired if I was trying to, to feed her with my left hand. She couldn't hold uh, Kendra because uh, she was afraid that she was going to drop her. She felt that she couldn't take care of her the way that a mother would take care of a newborn baby. Six weeks after giving birth, Teresa's symptoms are as acute as ever, and Frank insists she make a follow-up appointment with her OBGYN. The doctor really didn't have any concrete answer to give us of what was going on. The doctor said everything pregnancy-related should have gone away. You need to go see a neurologist. And know that if something's wrong, there can be really, really bad consequences to it. I told her that we needed to find the best doctor in San Antonio. Teresa immediately makes an appointment to meet with neurologist Dr. Praveen Thangada. Teresa was uh, very anxious because she was having this ongoing neurologic symptoms. I told him about the numbness in my face and the sensations in my extremities and the excruciating headache. So I did a detailed neurologic exam where we look at motor sensory functions, gait, reflexes. I knew Teresa has some neurologic abnormality. So I told Teresa that the next step would be to order an MRI of the brain. I kind of felt a little relief um, to have a doctor say that we need some more tests to be run. I want to be giving you the right answer. None of my other doctors did that, but I was really scared to wonder what the outcome was going to be. And I was out in the waiting room thinking of all of these things that we could find out. I was really worried. I just pray that everything will come out okay. I had a lot going through my mind. Having my daughter only six weeks old, having a 12-year-old, how I was going to be able to handle all this together when I did find out what the, the outcome was going to be. But nothing could have prepared Teresa or her family for what the test results reveal. Teresa's MRI showed an abnormality at the base of the brain, which could be dangerous. At this point, I told Teresa that it need to be taken care and that she need to see a neurosurgeon. The fear I had the most was to hear that there was something that was so serious that it could be life-threatening. It was kind of like, oh my God, now what? 
What is this girl gonna go through? How much more can Teresa handle? Throughout her pregnancy, Teresa Zidansky has experienced debilitating numbness and headaches. According to her doctors, they were simply the side effects of her pregnancy. But after her daughter's birth, an MRI has revealed a potentially life-threatening abnormality in her brain that requires immediate surgery. It was really hard because when you talk brain surgery, it's hard to really know what the outcome is going to be. I have referred Teresa to Dr. Holger Skerhut, neurosurgeon, and arranged to see him as soon as possible. When I looked at Teresa's MRI scan, um, there was a mass the size of a small plum between the cerebellum and the brainstem. So it became very clear that we were dealing with a very specific kind of tumor that is found most often in these locations called the neuroma. A neuroma is a non-cancerous tumor that grows out of specialized cells that protect nerve fibers. In a healthy individual, these cells support and insulate nerves the way plastic coating does on electrical wires. But in patients like Teresa, the cells multiply abnormally, forming a tumor that puts pressure on the nerves and inhibits their activity. The brain has 12 cranial nerves. Each cranial nerve has a very important motor and sensory function associated with it. And all these uh, cranial nerves eventually pass through the brainstem. As these neuromas grow, they begin to affect other cranial nerves and can compress the brainstem, so the nerves don't function properly. But we really do not know why um, these tumors occur. I was relieved for them to find what was causing all these symptoms, but I was feeling this can't be happening to me. My mom started crying. Um, I started crying. It was really hard. My heart sank. I couldn't do anything for her. I didn't. I didn't know how to console her. I didn't know what to say. Dr. Scarehood goes on to explain that all of Teresa's seemingly unrelated symptoms were a direct result of nerve damage. Because her first symptoms was numbness of her face, I felt confident that this probably was a neuroma involving the coating of the fifth nerve, which supplies sensation to the face. But because Teresa's symptoms not only involved her face, but also involved numbness and tingling on the left side of her body, it became clear that the tumor was not only large, but also was compressing the brainstem, all the major motor and sensory tracts pass through this region. And as Teresa's neuroma continued to grow, it culminated in an excruciating headache. The headaches are actually related to direct pressure of the brainstem. After he explained to me what the neuroma did, it all made perfect sense. And so now it's how do we take care of it? Because of the extreme compression of the brainstem, it became very important to remove the tumor as soon as possible. But the surgery isn't that simple. In fact, it could leave Teresa worse off than she is now. I knew that we had to sacrifice at least part of the fifth nerve since the tumor was intimately associated with it. Nevertheless, um, the, there are other cranial nerves that are quite close to the fifth nerve that could be damaged by removing the tumor. In addition, coma, paralysis, and death were considered risks to the procedure. I sat there thinking, I could just never wake up again, and my daughter will never know who I am. I could never see my son graduate, nor see him get married. That was really hard for me. Two weeks later, Teresa prepares herself for the risky surgery. And as she's wheeled into the operating room, her family begins a seemingly endless wait. It was a very emotional day for all of us. Worst fear is, is she going to make it through the surgery? Is she going to become paralyzed? When they wheeled her back, it crossed my mind that that might be the last time that I ever do see her. The operation took um, approximately six hours. 
Once the surgery was over, I went out to talk with the family. Um, I essentially told them that we were able to remove the entire tumor. It was very relieving to hear Dr. Schroeder had removed her tumor. I was very thankful that my wife was alive. It was a very, very big, heavy weight lifted off me. But the family's relief is short-lived. There have also been serious complications that will change Teresa's life forever. During the procedure, we had to sacrifice the fifth cranial nerve, so she would remain numb on the right side of her face. Unfortunately, the eighth cranial nerve, which allows us to hear and gives us balance, was permanently damaged, so she did have hearing loss in her right ear, and she remains uh, deaf to this day. In addition, small areas of the brainstem actually became permanently damaged, and as such, the nerves actually give false signals, and so she now permanently has numbness and tingling on the left side of her body. The numbness, the pins and needle feeling on my whole left side, it's still there, and it will always be there. But I'm here, and that's what counts. Although grateful to have survived the ordeal, Teresa can't help but wonder why so many doctors initially misread her symptoms. Neuromas are relatively rare. Also, it would be easy to misinterpret uh, Teresa's early symptoms as related uh, to the pregnancy. But as the symptoms progressed, the physicians were hampered uh, by the pregnancy since um, CAT scans and MRI scans are actually not performed uh, during pregnancies. In fact, Dr. Thangata thinks it's entirely possible that the pregnancy exacerbated Teresa's neuroma. It takes many years for these uh, tumors to grow to a size where it can actually start pushing on the nerve, but during the pregnancy, the immunity is lowered, and at this time, the tumor took over, started growing rapidly. Teresa's tumor developed so fast that without immediate intervention, the results would have been devastating. Teresa's brainstem had been compressed to half its size. If the tumor had gotten uh, much larger, the increasing pressure on the brainstem would lead to coma and even death. Fortunately, Teresa's tumor was caught in time, and today, four years later, her future looks bright. We scanned Teresa and have found no recurrence of her neuroma. Teresa's prognosis is excellent uh, for a long and, and healthy life. Though Teresa still struggles with the effects of the nerve damage, her family continues to help her every step of the way. Being on my feet, walking and doing the dishes, it's just harder to get around. My family has taken on such huge responsibilities for me. All of our lives have changed in some way. I spend more time at home and with her. My son, he takes on a lot of other responsibility, but it's brought us closer together. To assist other patients and their families as they go through similar experiences, Teresa has launched a support group to help raise awareness about her disease. You need to be your own advocate. If you feel it's not right, keep questioning until you find the answer that you're looking for, because once you find out what it is, it makes a big difference.